So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Hasshofer. This is the first in our series of NJ Act Special Population Core webinars for 2021. Uh, Georgette Timoney, who I see in my upper left, is uh, taking a lot of good initiative to get these moving along with Natalia uh, and uh, Jim Lloyd. Um, uh, Johannes just started as he was mentioning as assistant professor of economics at Stockholm University. After six years as assistant professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton, he's also a faculty research center at NBER and perhaps most important for today's talk, founder and scientific director of the Bisara Center, uh, which I may not be pronouncing right, uh, for behavioral economics, a research nonprofit in Nairobi. Uh, his research interests lie at the intersection of psychology, behavioral economics, and development economics. Um, his, uh, uh, so, so, so basically we have another Angus Deaton uh, in the development process. Uh, his research examines the question whether poverty has particular psychological consequences and whether these consequences in turn affect economic behavior. Uh, he holds a BA in psychology, physiology, and philosophy. Uh, is it really physiology? Yeah, that, they call it. No, it's the concentration they have now. Yeah, you could even do a whole BA in just physiology. Wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, because I know they always had the famous politics, philosophy, and what was the other one? What? Yeah, PPE. Yeah. They have the famous PPE, but this is a yeah. different one. And it 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 uh, perpetually gets confused with it. I've right. Never not. I've never met anybody who uh, <laughs> right. who didn't confuse it with PPE. Right. And holds a PhD in neurobiology from Harvard, a PhD from in economics from Zurich, and was most recently a prize fellow in economics at Harvard and the Jamil. Poverty Action Lab. So you can see he's a rather undereducated fellow, but uh, 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 nevertheless does brilliant work. And uh, uh, Johannes, take it away. Great. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and for having me and uh, for putting on this event. Um, it's been really great to be part of um, NJ Acts over the last couple of years to see the amazing work that you're doing. And I've I've always felt a little badly about being on the fringes of it, but I'm hoping that by showing you the resources that we've built in Kenya, that we can maybe integrate that, uh, that infrastructure a little more and make it useful for the work that, that you all do and that I've um, followed with such great interest and enthusiasm over the last few years. Um, and I should say that one of the people who's helped build this infrastructure that I'm gonna show you is Amanda, who's here. So she was uh, at, at Princeton for for several years and was instrumental in in setting up what I'm about to show you. So um, the point of departure for Busara was the realization that a lot of behavioral science uh, and science in general is done in uh, on populations that are called weird, uh, and they're weird and Weird is an acronym. It stands for Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic. Um, so here's a map that shows you the world scaled by population. Uh, India and China are very large. Uh, Africa is pretty big too, lots of young people there. But here's the world scaled by according to published research. Like where is the research done that is published in scientific journals and obviously Europe and the US are way overrepresented relative to population size or area. And Africa is this, this tiny little thing at the bottom. And so it, that, that's a really striking imbalance um, that so much of the world's population isn't captured um, by the research that we do. And that may in some cases not be a problem because some things are universal across human societies, but others may not be. And so we really may be missing a lot of important insights by not uh, also extending uh, our view towards uh, those populations. Um, 
And the particular field that I'm working in is, uh, as Steve said, experimental economics. So I try to understand economic behavior and preferences by basically asking people questions or uh, having them participate in tasks that tell us more about their behavior and preferences. So for example, you might ask someone in a lab uh, in front of a computer, would you prefer a smaller amount of money today or a large amount of money tomorrow or in a month from now? And that tells you something about how they trade off the present versus the future. And this kind of work was mostly done again in Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic societies. So here's a map from 2019 that shows you the decision labs in the world. So this work is usually done in labs like the, of the kind that I'm gonna show you. That's a computer room with a bunch of machines that uh, you invite people to, to give you answers to the questions that I just described. And these labs are mostly based in the US and Europe. Um, there's just a few in low income countries. And you can see here this little red dot, that's Busara in Kenya that I'm gonna tell you about. So um, this is 2019, the situation when I got started uh, in 2012 was, uh, was even bleaker. Uh, as far as I could tell, there was no lab that focused on low income countries at the time. And so that was the impetus for, for building Busara. So, uh, Here's the mission statement of Busara. We work with researchers and organizations to advance and apply behavioral science in pursuit of poverty alleviation. Um, and there's a couple of things to say about that mission statement. Uh, the first is that poverty allevi alleviation is very broadly construed and you can easily construe it in a health context. And so that's, I think, the sense in which it's most relevant to, um, to NJ Acts. Um, Researchers and organizations means that we both do basic science, but we also work with organizations to improve their programs with the one constraint that there has to be some sort of social mission, right? So we won't help Procter & Gamble improve their yogurt for the Kenyan market. We will help a social impact company deliver a better product to low income populations uh, using the insights of behavioral science. Um, and the advance and apply here means that we both, again, do basic science and we make it useful for uh, organizations that want to alleviate poverty. Um, and so the other thing to say at this stage is that we're a nonprofit. So it's a 501c3 in the US and registered as a nonprofit in Kenya. And so all the work that we do uh, is at cost. So we offer services to researchers and organizations and we take enough money to keep the lights on, but it's otherwise <clears throat> at cost. We don't make a profit. Um, so here's how Busara currently looks um, or looked as of, I think, last year. Uh, we started in Kenya where we currently have uh, just under a hundred full-time staff. Uh, but we also have offices in other countries, India, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Uganda, Nigeria. And so all together, we're somewhere around 120, 130 or so full-time staff. And in most countries we have, in some countries we have uh, fixed lab presences, and I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. In others, we have field projects where we go temporarily, even though we you know, we have an office in the capital maybe, but then we don't have a fixed lab. We set it up in the countryside as the need arises. So um, let me tell you more about the academic work because I think that's what's most relevant for this group. So we work with a range of partners, private organizations, nonprofits, public organizations like governments, but also academics. And this usually takes the form of a researcher and that can be anyone from a PhD student or even an undergraduate to a full professor, you know, Abhijit Banerjee, the recent Nobel laureate in economics has done projects with us. The whole range of uh, academics can do, can come to us and say, I'm interested in this question and I wanna study it uh, using your infrastructure. And then uh, we help them uh, either just run the study that they've already designed or we help them think through what the design should look like to make the study possible. So there's sort of a range of different possible engagements um, that we can provide. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about, uh, a little more about how these labs look around the world. So we have um, three 
types of labs, uh, st standing labs or fixed labs, uh, where we can control the environment very tightly and that allow is a good way to get at mechanisms. We have uh, mobile labs uh, and there's like two different types of those that I'll show you more in a second um, that we can deploy flexibly in the field. And we have recently started embedding labs in organization, uh, in organizations and real world contexts. So a few more details on these. So in Nairobi is our largest fixed lab. And that typically looks like this. There's cubicles where people sit by computers uh, that all have touchscreen monitors and they can participate in studies. And these studies are typically behavioral studies in the sense that people get presented with tasks on the computer screen or through headphones and they provide responses also on the computer screen uh, by clicking on things or pointing at things, uh, sometimes entering things. So the screens are all touch screens, which means that even people who uh, are computer illiterate can participate. And usually the experiments are structured such that people who can't read and write can participate. So the instructions are in audio, the response fields are colored. Um, most people can read numbers. Um, so we, we've over the years figured out how to work with a variety of populations, even with low literacy and computer literacy levels. And so uh, you can see here, and Amanda will recognize this, uh, people uh, on the left in the, in the computer room participating in a study. On the right, there's someone preparing the computer room. So the cubicles are numbered and we randomly assign people to seats before the start of a session to make sure that they're not sitting next to their friend. Um, at the bottom, you can see a waiting room where people get briefed about the study beforehand. And that's where we do informed consent. People sign the consent form. They get read the consent form and then they sign it. Uh, here's another computer lab. So we have three of these in Nairobi with a total uh, uh, of around 50 seats or so. Uh, whoops. Uh, yeah. So that's how that looks. And there's a control computer that you can see here in the corner. Uh, and that's the computer that controls what happens on the screens of all the individual computers. So we run various softwares. The most prominent one is called Ztree and Otree that uh, displays stimuli on the individual screens. Um, here's an example of a mobile lab. Uh, so these are laptops that we, we have a number of different mobile labs. This one has laptops, others are just tablets that we can pack in a big suitcase and they go in the back of a Jeep. And then we can take that to the countryside and set up uh, experiments there. So this is an example from uh, a place close to Lake Victoria in Western Kenya. Uh, where we ran a study. And this usually takes the form of renting a room somewhere and then setting up the computers there. They get networked through Wi-Fi with each other. And so then you can have people participate in tasks. They can even be interactive tasks. So often people play games with other people in the room. Uh, you can, in principle, even do those games over the web. So they could play games with someone, let's say in New Jersey, for example. Um, here's another mobile lab in North Uganda that was slightly more uh, basic conditions, it was rented a, a, a school to run the study. Um, here's a mobile lab in Fiji. So we had a project on nutrition uh, in Fiji. Uh, so there's a lot of obesity in Fiji and the idea was to uh, deploy, uh, embed messages uh, about nutrition in a popular TV program. And so we worked with the producers of this TV program to develop messages that people would find appealing. And because it's very expensive to immediately insert these messages into the TV program, we piloted them in the lab and uh, you know, to understand whether people responded well to them. And here's the, uh, the ultimate version of a mobile app. This is a bus in India. So for one project in India, we, we bought a bus and fitted it with a lab. So, uh, we inserted, installed the power supply and uh, networked these computers into the bus. And so the bus could travel around India uh, and have people participate um, very flexibly wherever it showed up. Uh, this was in the context of a project that uh, aimed to increase uptake of iron supplements for pregnant women in, in Haryana. 
Uh, and here's an example of an embedded lab. So we've recently started to work with organizations that um, are interested in applying behavioral science to their programs and improving their service delivery using insights from behavioral science. And some of them have gone as far as to embed teams, behavioral science teams in their organization. Perhaps the most prominent example of this is the British government, which for many years now has had a group called the Behavioral Insights Team that's directly embedded in the office of the prime minister. Uh, so it's very high level. And uh, I should say that this wasn't, our, this wasn't our doing. This is something that happened independently of us. Um, but they've been extremely successful at influencing policy with very simple insights from behavioral science. Uh, partly because of the access that they had, but also partly because many of these behavioral insights are very powerful in driving behavior. Um, and so we're doing similar things. Here's an example from the Central Bank of Nigeria, who, um, who put a team aside to learn about behavioral science. And so we ran uh, trainings for them and embedded a team uh, from our organization with them uh, to improve their, their service delivery. Okay, so uh, I'll conclude with a few more numbers about the, um, the lab. So just the lab arm of Busara. So as I mentioned, we do a number of things, field research, um, uh, work with organizations and so on. But the, the labs that you saw where people sit in front of computers, uh, that arm of the organization has 25 staff members at the moment, and we can test 56 participants at the same time, uh, running two sessions concurrently. And in Nairobi, we have a subject pool of about 50,000 people recruited from the Nairobi informal settlements. So when you run a study, you can just draw from that subject pool. And we know from each person in that subject pool, not only a number of demographics, so how old they are, their gender, their education level, and so on, uh, but also what other studies they've participated in previously. So you could, exam for example, choose people that have never participated in the kind of experiment that you're about to run. And uh, in any given year, we run around about 10,000 subjects in the, uh, in the Nairobi lab and then a few more in the mobile labs elsewhere. Um, so uh, that's the slides that I have. Um, let me maybe wrap up by telling you briefly how you would go about running a project with us. So the best way to do it is to just go to the website and find someone's email. Uh, like my email or the CEO's email. We're still a small enough organization that you can just email the bosses, basically. Uh, I should say I'm not really the boss anymore. I'm just one person on the board and uh, I get outvoted on a lot of things. Um, so you can um, just send an email and uh, say, here's the project idea that I have, or here's the um, project that I'm running in New Jersey. I'm thinking of something similar in, in a developing country. Can you help me develop that? Um, and then we'll put together uh, a budget together to see what that would cost. Uh, think a bit about um, various ways of implementing it. So maybe you want to use a fixed lab. Maybe you want to use a mobile lab. Maybe it's a in a field project entirely where you do household surveys instead of getting people together in one place. Um, so there's various ways of doing it. And because our staff have done this for so many years now, they're very good at knowing what, what works and what doesn't in the local context. And so you'll have some conversations with them based on their local expertise and then together develop the project. Um, and then, um, if you already have funding, uh, great, we can get started. Uh, you need to get IRB in the country usually, uh, depending on which country it is, but Kenya, for example, you need to get IRB. We have a special uh, designated person who helps you doing that. Uh, we have a team of programmers who help you program uh, the experiments. Um, and then the people who collect the data in the labs, like I mentioned, have a lot of experience doing that. So they've, some of them have been doing that since 2012 every day of the week. So they're extremely good at it. Um, and then we send you the data. So you get a data set um, that's as clean as you would like. So we have data people who can clean it for you if you like, uh, and then you can analyze your data. Uh, we also have people who can do that for you if you like, but mostly people want to do that themselves. So 
in the case where you don't have money yet, uh, we help you find it. So um, we can help you apply for grants, provide the relevant documents that you need and so on. Um, we try to be especially nice to PhD students. So when a PhD student comes on a shoestring budget, um, we often try to find efficiencies to make it work for them. Um, yeah, so I think that's those are sort of the basic uh, nuts and bolts of how to run projects. So maybe I'll stop here and um, we can have some questions. I see the question. It's um, what is the typical participant reimbursement for studies you conduct? So I'll give you two answers. One is what a typical participant costs you, the researcher, and the other is what the person gets. So, and this answer was correct last year and I don't know if it's still correct, but I think we charge like $25 per participant for everything that I just described, like recruiting them, making the lab available, the staff that recruit the person, the staff that supervise the lab session, the programmers that program the survey and so on. Um, that's 25 per participant. Um, there's various ways of you can structure the budget, like you can choose to go like whatever things cost, um, but the sort of easy to budget way is 25 bucks per person, plus whatever they earn in the experiment. And that's usually somewhere between five and $10 per participant, I would say. Um, and that often varies with uh, their behavior in the study. Right. So if someone like, for example, in a risk task, somebody might be asked, do you want a coin toss between uh, zero dollars and ten dollars or do you want five dollars for sure? And then depending on what they choose, they get paid the result of that coin toss or they get their five dollars for sure. And so they usually end up somewhere between five and ten. We try to make sure that nobody leaves with zero. Are the participants all adults or are they adolescents as well? Um, I'm. So they are in the core subject pool, they're all adults. Um, we are about to do a large project with kids um, from anywhere between four and 17. Um, and in many of the studies, we do survey both adults and kids. Um, and I believe there was another project that also had kids. But so yes, we have some people in the subject pool who are kids, but there isn't like a big systematic subject pool of kids. But the, it would be relatively easy to create. So in the case where the subject pool doesn't have the population you want, uh, we can just recruit them. Right? So that's generally very quick. The way that that works is we go to an informal settlement, we set up shop there, and then we find the population that you're interested in. And that usually doesn't take too long. Is um, uh, How has all of this model been affected by COVID? And have you had to move to some other models where uh, maybe people would use cell phones or you would you would have the place only popu partly populated? Uh, how have you been handling um, those kinds of kinds of issues? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have been affected by COVID. Um, Kenya locked down last year. It's now much more open again than most of Europe and the US, um, partly because the population is very young and so people didn't get all that ill. Um, but we are still remote at Posara, so everybody's working from home and we had to shut down field activities. So sometime last summer, we shut down all the field work um, and all the lab studies and we switched to phone surveys. So we've been doing experiments on the phone uh, and that works for some things and it doesn't work for others. Like if you want to show someone a video and then gauge their reaction to that, you're out of luck. But many of the things we, we do can be done over the phone. And so there's two ways that we do that. One is to just call people up and we have software that does that and a team that is experienced in doing it. The other is we have an app called Kite, uh, which uh, allows people to participate on smartphones. Uh, in studies. So they get, we can push a survey to their smartphone and they can uh, complete that on their phone. Um, that's not, you know, not many people in Kenya have smartphones as of yet. Almost everybody has a mobile phone, but smartphones are still pretty low, like 15, 20% or something. Okay. So that doesn't work for everybody. Um, we're now in a situation where we will go back to the field if someone has a good reason. So, um, 
you know, you basically, there's like an internal application process to explain why you really need to go back to the field now and what the safety protocol is that you're proposing to put in place. And then if someone makes their case, we, we, we will do it. Uh, so I just wrote that application myself and I'm waiting to hear back from the powers that I don't control. So in principle, we're back in the field now, but with a lot of caution. Johannes, I actually wanted to ask you a question. What have you found to be your greatest challenges? Um, that's an interesting and very broad question. Um, well, okay, I'll say something and then I'm actually curious to hear what Amanda thinks because she's actually uh, different from me in that she's done a lot of the legwork, uh, like working on the ground, running the studies uh, more than most of my other RAs, she's been like very deeply involved in running the studies on the ground. So, you know, from, I'll say it from an organizational perspective, um, I, I think the um, translating research paradigms from the Western settings in which they were developed into the local context is the big challenge. And that's kind of the, the whole point of the organization. And I think we've gotten much better at that. But in the beginning, we, you know, we screwed that up a lot. Like we, we presented people tasks that were way too complex that, you know, people who have barely attended elementary school had no hope of understanding, at least not in the space of the like hour or two that we allotted. And so, you know, simplifying tasks, taking uh, the time to explain them that's needed that's been the biggest learning experience, I think. Could you, Johannes, turn that into, you know, that 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 scientific problem into uh, a research question itself, as as uh, uh, populations of um, uh, uh, less wealthy countries are becoming, you know, as as formal education is spread, you have such a wide range. Of education, so I would think in the behavioral science side of things, um, and 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 you know I think this is a very interesting question for us in the weird countries because in the weird countries we have certain stereotypes about people who haven't gotten formal education, and they come from the fact that uh, uh, in in a system of universal education, people who don't get as much formal education, you know, there's various kinds of sorting mechanisms, but in, in, uh, um, in places like Africa, uh, you have such a number of extremely smart people by any way that you would want to measure smart, uh, who didn't have the opportunity for formal education. So the question, you know, the, the, how did, how did it do these kind of decision-making processes work for, people who may be very smart in, in, you know, how does the formal education uh, change these kinds of decision-making uh, processes uh, in, 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 uh, in situations where there isn't still universal access to yeah. know, public education? That's a very interesting question. I was just asked to explain WEIRD again. So WEIRD is an acronym that stands for Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic. The societies where most of behavioral science has been done that we're trying to get away from. So on the question, I think it's a super interesting question. Like there are correlation, very strong correlations between education and the behaviors that we measure. So for example, educated people tend to be much more patient than others. And that has a ton of confounds, especially as you say, if you study this in the sort of weird context, you might get that correlation, but maybe not in a place like Kenya where everybody's poor. Mm -hmm. or, or most people are poor. And so um, those are precisely the kinds of questions that this infrastructure is supposed to answer. Um, and even, so that's like at the level of a correlation, even a step before that, um, you know, you might think that behaviors themselves look very different. So, you know, for example, um, how people trade off uh, outcomes at different times or, or risky outcomes uh, right. might, might be quite different. Um, right, maybe right, exactly. What are they all, you know, what are the different, you know, what are the, the different ways that life circumstances help you define what is, what is risk? What to you would be right. a big risk? 
Yeah, so, and we definitely come across people interpreting things very differently. Like one example is that we had one task where people uh, have to do a public speaking exercise called the Trier Social Stress Test. It's meant to induce stress. And I should really hand over to Amanda because she's the expert. But um, people in Kenya are much more content to hold forth for 20 minutes and don't find it so stressful. Whereas in Europe and the US, it freaks people out to have to do this. And so it's not a very good stress induction method in Kenya. That's though, quite fascinating. Yeah. Is this a, you, you relate that to sort of a, a, a tradition of village culture? Uh, Potentially, a storytelling much, culture. Yeah, there's much more of a tradition of like standing up and holding a speech. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, Amanda, do you have things to add on like the challenges question or the sort of differences in general about in behavior? Yeah. So when I was working there, I think a major challenge, which I'm sure is so smoothed out by now, um, was the seamlessness of mobile labs. So when I was there, we were just starting the, the mobile labs. Um, so there were some like technical difficulties with that or just like logistic challenges. But the team, there's so many different teams within Busara that like everyone brings a different expertise and we were able to like solve them so quickly. Um, I guess another challenge is very specific to the project of um, with the Salivets. Um, so definitely like new projects bring up some challenges, but there's just such a broad, um, like really, uh, there's so many different teams that have expertise in the areas that challenges come up. So I feel like they just get solved and smoothed over so quickly. I was fascinated, Johannes, and let me let me again say, and I'll I'll, I'll keep saying, uh, uh, please everybody, uh, jump into the conversation, you know, if possible by uh, um, by putting something in the chat. Um, so uh, we we do want to get as many people as possible involved in the conversation, but uh, um, also since Johannes gave us a very uh, uh, sort of um, uh, left us plenty of time. Uh, we, we, we might invite you if there's time to get a little more into the science of what, what you've, uh, what's been learned, uh, in, the, in these studies. So one thing that I, I, I thought was on one, on one of your slides that I thought was quite fascinating was, uh, a study that, uh, uh had something to do with, with, uh, um, ethnic, um, uh, ethnic identification versus, I guess, implicitly xenophobia, uh, and how that relates to decision making, which uh, uh, at this moment in the United States, uh, where we have such a level of uh, tribal conflict, uh, it, it seems particularly salient. So I wondered if you could uh, talk about that a little bit. Yep, uh, happy to. And let me briefly, before I do that, ask, answer the question from Ashley in the chat, which is, are staff hired from local communities? And the answer is yes. We're um, proud to be, I think, 85, 90% Kenyan in our staff with the sort of sore spot that a lot of the high level staff are still uh, from the US or from Europe. And we're working hard on, on making that more equitable. But at most levels of the organization were very local. And that's Kenyans in Kenya and then others, you know, Nigerians in, in Lagos and so on. Um, so on, on Steve's um, question, we've run a couple of projects and Kenya lends itself to this particularly well because there are large uh, tribal groups that don't always have the best of relations. So some of you may recall the 2007, 2008 post-election violence in Kenya that largely ran along um, ethnic lines. And so we've run a number of studies where, excuse me, we recruit participants from different ethnic groups. So this is a typical study where we would go out and do targeted recruitment rather than choosing from the subject pool. At this point, it's large enough. There's enough people from every, every tribe. But in the beginning, we recruited separately and then uh, have people in the lab participate in economic exchange games where they interact either with someone from the same ethnic group 
or with someone from a different ethnic group. And they're asked questions such as, you have $10 at your disposal. Do you want to share anything with this other person? And you, that's you know, just because you want to be a nice person. Um, or do you want to share nothing? And then depending on who they are, you might share more or less. So if they're an out-group member, you might share less. If they're an in-group member, you might share more. Are these and, multiple round games, Johannes, or, or just so sort of trying to tap some kind of altruism? It's the one that I just described is a one shot dictator game that's just trying to get it altruism in a one shot, completely anonymous interaction. And so that's precisely the beauty of the lab that you can credibly make a game not multi round, right? right? So in the real world, these ethnic interactions are usually multi round in quotes because you might meet that person again. Uh, and if they know who you are and how you treated them the last time they saw you, right? You know. They might not like that. Whereas in the lab, it's completely anonymous. All they know is the ethnicity and maybe their age or their gender or something like that to obscure a little bit the, our interest in ethnicity. Um, and so then we can be much more certain that what we're measuring is truly their uh, pure willingness to give to share with an anonymous stranger, rather than how much they worry about their reputation and, and so on. But, but wouldn't it be uh, also interesting, maybe you've already done this, is to, to see how the, uh, uh, the ethnicity uh, uh, fits into, into multi-round games. So according to theory, the multi-round game will settle down after several rounds of tit for tat, but, but uh, uh, it might take longer if you don't have the, you know, if you don't have the level of, uh, uh, the, the the level of trust. Um, I always uh, remember what what Max Weber had to say about uh, uh, the different ethnic groups in the development of capitalism. That when you had you had certain groups uh, uh, like Baptists, where there was a very strong ethic of honesty, business honesty, in their culture. So they were always trusted not to screw you, and yeah. and consequently they would do very well in business. But right. You know how that works in in societies that have these kinds of uh, fragmentations. You know, at the level of you know, how much does it take to build build trust, or how much of a uh, presumption of distrust uh, do you do you come in with? Yeah, and I, so that's a really interesting question, and uh, it would be super interesting. We haven't actually done that to see whether. So I think the result that you're referring to is that when you have people cooperate and you expose them to a tit for tat strategy, it slowly unravels and you might right. expect it to unravel more slowly when people have a high level of trust because you right. have you're willing to give your co-ethnic the benefit of the doubt. Whereas if a non-co-ethnic screws you over the second time you're done. Um, and so we haven't actually tried that. That's a great, uh, great idea. Um, and more generally, I think, I mean, culture is the kind of thing that this kind of setup uh, lends itself to study. And, um, and it's not, so the other thing to say is that we, like this, um, the prejudice is that there are like large ethnic biases in the setting and they are there, but they're not entirely straightforward to find. So in the early studies, there's a prominent paper published in one of the big economics journals that from our lab that shows that there isn't ethnic bias in, in our setting, uh, in these games that I just described. And then only last year did we figure out a way to structure the games to, uh, to demonstrate the ethnic bias that we thought was there. But that's to say that, you know, it is there if you look carefully, but it's also not sort of overpowering, even in this like very uh, anonymous lab setting where people can get away with it and they know. Do it. any of these studies extend to sort of political decision making? Which party would I trust? Which leader would I trust? And and uh, uh, and those those you know those kind of kind of questions. Um, we do have a whole number of political scientists who do studies with us. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know details of those studies, but that's actually one of our biggest constituency apart from economists and psychologists as political scientists uh, who often ask questions of this kind. I don't know detailed examples. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the science of some of the studies that you've done? Yeah. Um, 
So maybe let me describe something that, uh, that Amanda worked on, uh, at least partly. Uh, so I've been interested in the effects of stress on decision making for a long time. And um, this is also related to the ethnicity topic that we just discussed. And so uh, the, the stylized finding that I, um, that I mentioned earlier is that people, um, that, that it's thought that there are ethnic tensions in countries like Kenya and uh, post-election violence is an example of that. But then in the lab, it's often been difficult to demonstrate those. I told you that there's this one early study that we had that showed, no, there isn't any ethnic bias in when we run these games in the lab. Um, and so one possible explanation for that is that maybe these ethnic tensions only come to the fore uh, under in situations of stress. So when tensions are running high because there's a disputed election or something like that, that's when people uh, show biases towards the in-group and against the out-group. And the way that we try to tackle that experimentally is by manipulating independently and simultaneously uh, co-ethnic identity and stress in the lab. And the way we manipulated stress is by giving people um, hydrocortisone pills. So um, we had pills manufactured that either contained hydrocortisone or placebo. And I should say, this went through several rounds of ethics review, uh, both in the US and in Kenya. And we've also run similar studies in the US. So this is not something that, you know, I would only do in Kenya. Um, I think we should also do it in Kenya because uh, we care about that population. But um, it's um, it's ethically sound. Can you talk a little bit about what the cortisone does versus uh, other models that you might have? Yeah, so it raises cortisol levels very directly, and um, so the cortisone becomes cortisol. Yes, exactly. Okay. So as soon as you ingest it, it gets a water. Like the difference is one water molecule, and um, that's the biologically active version that goes into your brain and binds to receptors, and so. Uh, you should think of that as basically raising, pharmacologically raising stress hormone levels uh, in a cleaner way than many of the other interventions can do. So this intervention that I described earlier, uh, where you give a public speech in front of a panel of judges, some people find that stressful, others don't. That's one problem. Another problem is that it manipulates all sorts of neurobiological markers. So not just cortisol, but adrenaline, noradrenaline, sympathetic nervous system, and so on. Um, and so hydrocortisone is very clean. So that's the stress manipulation. Then the ethnicity manipulation is the one that I described. You interact in economic exchange games, either with someone from the same ethnic group or from a different ethnic group. And you do that either while you're under the influence of hydrocortisone or under the influence of placebo. Uh, and so we measure whether you're more pro-social or less pro-social when you're stressed and when you're interacting with an outgroup member. And so the answer is, you are less pro-social when you're stressed. You're also less pro-social when you interact with someone from a different ethnic group. And so if you put those two together, that means you're least pro-social when you're stressed and when you're interacting with someone from a different ethnic group. So were that's- Were looking for an interaction? Right, we were looking for an interaction. So I, and I should be careful to say that we don't find an interaction. So we find two main effects. There's a main effect of stress and there's a main effect of co-ethnicity, but there isn't an interaction. So it, this is kind of a subtle point. The large, the people are the nastiest when they're stressed and when they're interacting with a non-co-ethnic, but that each of those effects isn't differentially larger compared to um, the main effects. So there's no interaction, but there are two main effects that add, add together. Wow, that's really interesting. And I mean, it's 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 a very controllable model. So as you said, you know, exper ex experimental, uh, sort of uh, uh, in the best sense. And and uh, uh, this does does this sort of mimic? Now, of course, that's that's acute stress. Yes. You call it acute stress. <laughs> Amanda, do you want to tell your story of suffering? <laughs> so. Amanda did a lot of work. So we were very interested in chronic stress uh, for, for a long time. Uh, and the way that we tried to get at that was to repeat these 
exposures for several days in a row. So we had a study where people were exposed to these stressors seven days in a row. How much uh, did you have to pay those people? A lot more. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And so um, we didn't actually see differential effects of chronic stress. Now, you know, that's not, that's a pretty, that's a poor man's version of chronic stress. Like seven days in a row is not the same as living in poverty for 20 years, but for what it's worth, other people had shown differences between repeated exposure on that time horizon and one time exposure, and we didn't see those. So to our eyes, at least initially, it looks like there that difference isn't large. If you fall though, back to something a little bit less uh, rigorous, perhaps, but, but maybe more a measure of chronic stress, because the things that we worry about uh, in uh, uh, um, and 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 I really I really love the way that uh, Bob Sapolsky uh, has described this uh, process among Africans, where where uh, in fact wasn't he working in Kenya? Yes. Uh, where in Kenya, where where uh, the Westernizing classes were were uh, according to his account. Uh, particularly if they start moving into sort of uh, managerial type type roles, he describes as being a situation of very high chronic stress uh, that tended to bring on hypertension and other bad outcomes. And of course, that was the same kind of stress uh, that he was studying in his uh, baboon communities. So, uh, I mean, can you get measures of those kind of chronic stresses in the U.S.? We uh, uh, we like to look at uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences, or we have we have different measures of, of uh, chronic stress, and um, you know you might not so quickly get rid of the hypothesis that the effects of chronic stress on decision making could be very different than the effects of acute stress. Yeah, that's right. And so I guess there's two questions here. One is how you measure it, and the other is how you manipulate it. And and how you manipulate it. I only have answers in the positive direction. So we can't ethically increase chronic stress, but we can try to decrease it in various ways. And so one way that I've tried to do that is through cash transfers, just giving people money. Another way that I've done it is through psychotherapy. So giving people a psychotherapy program. Um, so that's the sense in which you can study changes. Has, in that, has, that, been one, that, has that been one of your, your studies? Yeah. Uh, we, we just finished a study where well, we, Jamie and I, and, and I imagine some other people would love to hear more about that one. Okay. I'd be happy to send a link. Yeah. It's a working paper on my website. Yeah. Uh, but just then, tell us a little bit about that because at the Institute, you have lots of people interested in, in depression and, and, uh, and mental health issues of, of, of that kind and what therapy could possibly do. Ah, uh, great. Okay. Let me, let me say one quick thing about measurement before that, which is that, um, there and that's a more general point we we are able to measure and be, it might be relevant to this group a bunch of biomarkers so there are good labs in kenya that we've worked with uh and we have nurses uh, we've had nurses on staff and uh easy access to local physicians so we have done uh invasive things like taking blood samples uh, i've measured cytokines in in previous work uh you could probably do genotyping if you wanted to. It's getting saliva is pretty easy from people. So um, you can do a bunch of bio things that I haven't mentioned yet. So just to throw that out there. So the, um, uh, oh, we should finish too much. Yeah. Uh, says. Okay, let me talk about the psychotherapy project. So the idea there was to test basically what you might've heard of as the social causation and social drift hypotheses. Uh, the former of which says that poverty leads to ill mental health and the latter says ill mental health leads to more right. poverty. And the idea was to see which of these uh, connections is causal and which is stronger. And so in order to get at that, you want to manipulate both poverty and mental health independently and jointly. And so the study that we ran randomized people into one of uh, four groups. One was a control group and then one was one that got a, an $1,100 unconditional cash transfer. Another wow. group uh, got five weeks of psychotherapy. This is a short-term program developed by the WHO. In lower income contexts, these uh, short-term programs are pretty prevalent. So that, that was the flagship program. And then the third group got, uh, uh, the fourth group got both programs together. Um, and 
we look at a whole variety of outcomes, um, maybe most importantly, mental health. And we found that a year later, the psychotherapy did absolutely nothing to mental health, unfortunately. But the cash transfers were very effective at improving mental health. So people who got this cash were much better off in terms of depression and happiness. And this is true despite the fact that the cash was actually cheaper than the psychotherapy. Wow, that's really impressive. And I think we're, we should, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a good note to wrap up on. And thank you so much for organizing. And it was really great to hear all your questions. And yeah, uh, send me an email anytime. I'm happy to send you links or, or talk about. And if anybody's interested in working uh, at Bazaar, just let me know. We're, we're here to help the community do, do good science. That's great. And, you know, your move to Stockholm ho hopefully won't uh, foreclose the opportunities for uh, not at uh, all additional collaboration. Not at all. No, no, no. Anybody can can work at Bazaar. And I'm also, of course, keen to stay in touch with all of you.